Hey Vanguard. So today, September 25th, we have Pastor Joshua Simonette, who is a pastor and a friend of mine. We got to serve together in Washington, D.C., a national community church for over four years as pastors, as campus pastors of our multi-site church out there. He's now in Baltimore, Maryland, as he'll mention, and he is serving the inner city community of Baltimore, Maryland. He'll explain more about that. But today, Pastor Joshua is going to have some real talk about what is reconciliation and what do we as the people of God need to do about reconciliation. Not the way of the world's reconciliation, but the way Christ has called us to be reconciled. More of the ministry of reconciliation, rooted in love, rooted in a heart for God and for people. And so I want to just introduce Pastor Joshua Simonette. Oh, he didn't mention this, but I'll just say it. He, he has been to Vanguard. He did mention that. But he also played professional football in the NFL for over three years. So he's an athlete. He's a hard worker. He's a champion. So give it up for Pastor Joshua. Hey, Vanguard, so good to be with you all again. Honored and excited to be sharing with you. Actually, this is two times in one year. Um, just humbled that you guys would have me back for a second time. Last time I was with you uh, was February. I mean, that seems like uh, another time period. And it's probably because it's true. Um, so much has happened since then. Obviously, We've been experiencing a pandemic, um, nothing like it in my lifetime that I've ever experienced. And then, you know, we've been uh, seeing a lot of civil unrest around the country, even around the world, uh, as a result of the untimely deaths of Ahmaud Arbery and George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and Rashad Brooks and many, many others before them um, as well. And, you know, I have to be honest, as a black man in this country, um, it's very heavy for me and it, and it weighs me down. And also being a father of, of a black son, you know, I think about uh, him growing up uh, and, and it, it's weighty for me. But the one thing I can tell you is that I will not allow this or anything to weigh me down. Um, as a matter of fact, it's just going to fuel me to, to push harder. And, you know, I, I actually have a lot of hope, um, not because I'm just unrealistically optimistic or um, just trying to ignore things and being positive. I, I just know that the hope of the gospel is real and I've experienced it and I've seen uh, good things come out of really uh, bad situations. And so that's what I'm anticipating and that's what I'm expecting. And, and, and I'm I'm actually looking forward to seeing what's going to happen next. And speaking of things that are happening next and hoping and having some level of excitement uh, this next season for me personally, I don't know if you guys know, but I, I run a nonprofit called Blueprint um, over in uh, Baltimore, Maryland, and uh, it's aimed at uh, disrupting the school to prison pipeline. And uh, man, in this next season, we're going to be launching a mobile learning lab, and I'm really excited about that. Um, this will allow us to create access um, for um, particular students and lack of access is something that contributes to the school to prison uh, pipeline. But what we're going to do is we're going to take this old RV and we're going to just like basically uh, pimp it out. We're going to make it the, one of the dopest things that you've ever seen. We're going to turn it into like a mobile classroom and we're going to have iPads and laptops and even virtual technology, um, virtual reality technology, I should say. That we're gonna use, and so um, I'm I'm super super uh, pumped about this. And you know what? Actually, it makes me think about this show back in the day that some of you may have seen called Pimp My Ride. And uh, as a matter of fact, speaking of Pimp My Ride, the the place where they would take these um, um, broke down, uh, just beat up vehicles is a place called West Coast Customs, which is actually very very close to the Vanguard campus. Um, matter of fact, I think you take 55 North and like 91 East right over to Corona. And that's where West Coast Customs is. And and basically they would just uh, take these vehicles and they would transform them into something completely new and different. 
And if they were left in their present state, I mean, they just probably wouldn't make it much longer and uh, wouldn't 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 have the ability to uh, um, really make, uh, I guess, a, a huge impact or a difference in people's lives. So what West Coast Customs did is uh, completely transform uh, these these vehicles and take them from the old um, to the new. And it makes me think about what I think our society, uh, where our society is right now. If left up to our own accord or left up to us trying to figure this stuff out, I don't think that we will. And I think we're just going to keep seeing a cycle um, if we're just left to our own accord. And that just reminds me of what I want to talk about uh, for the next uh, few moments. Um, you know, I'm I'm thinking about how um, our society, you know, is is really ravaged by sin. And sin is just a separation between God and man. And we've been seeing these things go on since the beginning of time. Evil has come into the world, separated us um, from God. And when that separation came in, um, it allowed evil and bad things to come into the world. Things like racism and supremacy and bigotry and, and hatred and all of those things are a reflection of that. And God knew that if we continued in our current state, that it would be problematic for us. Uh, he knew that he couldn't leave us uh, in, that, in that same place. And so eventually God sent Jesus to close this gap separating us. And Jesus's mission was really kind of similar to West Coast customs, but even better. It was to transform us and make us into something completely new. One, complete restoration and reconciliation back to God and each other. And then two, to make us ambassadors doing the same thing in partnership with Jesus. If you have a Bible, I would love for you to go to 2 Corinthians chapter number 5, verses 16 through 21. And I want you to listen to the way Paul explains this whole idea to these Christians in a place called Corinth. I'm going to read from the New International Version, and here is what it says. So from now on, um, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him, the him would be Jesus, who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So exactly what does all of this mean? Uh, for the rest of our time uh, today, I, I want to just talk to you about the ministry and the message of reconciliation. And more importantly, I want you to be able to answer the question, what is the ministry and the message of reconciliation? Well, first, let, let's understand what Paul has just said to us or what we have just read. Uh, in Christ, we have been transformed. We've been made new, kind of like that show Extreme Home Makeover. I mean, just something completely different. Sin brought corruption and corrosion into our hearts and minds. But if we are in Christ, it's a game changer. We're, we're no longer the old person. All of that stuff is passed away. 
So then following verse 17, we see this term reconcile a couple of different times, uh, repeated five times. So, so reconcile is mentioned, uh, uh, I should say, a couple of different ways or, or uh, the word reconciliation is, is, is termed uh, uh, differently a couple of different times, but five times it's mentioned. So, so let's define reconcile or reconciliation to understand what this means, because this is a really uh, a key term, a key thing uh, for us to understand. The world that I come from, you know, we talked a lot about reconciliation and still do talk about reconciliation in terms of like black people and white people getting along. And as we can see, we got a lot of division amongst black people and white people in this country. And it has a lot to do with the history of this country. And so we we've, we've somehow uh, in some way maybe reduced reconciliation down to that. And I've been to a bunch of reconciliation lunches and dinners and fellowships and that sort of stuff. And it's good, but it's way, way bigger than that. So let's zoom out for a second. For that, for, for for reconciliation to happen, that means something has 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 been broken or broken down. And as I noted earlier, Genesis three, the fall of man, sin comes in, separates us from God, and then man takes on a sin nature. And so then and now, man is sub, is seduced by this idea that we call supremacy. And when I say supremacy, I'm, I'm talking about this power uh, or, or this, this, this rightness, this lust to have power and be right, destroying the essence of right relationship that God had established with man. So Jesus came to restore this right relationship with God and man. And then with man and each other. So God and us. So this upward, downward, and then one another. This across. So that, that would be like the cross. That's what Jesus came to do. The, the word reconcile in the Greek is katalaso, or to be reconciled is katalage. And it literally means to restore favor, value, or to... Um, adjust the difference. In other words, make it right. The sin nature is really about supremacy and lusting to be right. Not a prioritization to make things right. Those are not the same things. Pursuing rightness and trying to be right versus making things right it's not the same thing, but when we are in Christ, everything shifts, even our prioritization shifts, and we now have a new ministry and a new message called reconciliation, and that becomes our priority. So then what does, what does that mean? Well, the ministry or what I would say work of reconciliation is about our actions making things right. This is what we see in verse 18 that we just read. This, this whole notion of making things right is what Jesus modeled for us. Jesus did this with such great humility and sacrifice. And sometimes I think we're trying to pursue reconciliation or restoration or trying to make things right at a discount. Like, I mean, we're, we're trying to figure out like, okay, what words do I need to use or what programs do I need to implement or what percentage of diversity, you know, do we need to have to have everyone feel included? And there's, there's not that any of those things are wrong, but those things are secondary because what we need to be doing is the hard work of searching our hearts. What's on the inside of us and are we doing that work because we cannot have true reconciliation with just adjusting policies although policies are extremely important and we need to be we need to be engaged in that work we we cannot pursue reconciliation just by raising our awareness and reading certain books about you know black history or you know any other kinds of history um, you know, that, that, to, to help us be more, those are good. We need to be doing those things, 
But but reconciliation won't occur just because we are doing those things. We have to do this by pursuing humility and sacrifice. And guess what? In order to really do that, we got to do it in partnership with Jesus. Because you and I don't have the power to do that on our own. Because sometimes, you know what? Some folks just get on my nerves. And, and I want to give them a piece of my real mind. Not what Jesus said, but what I say. So we need to do that in relationship or in partnership with Jesus to give us access to be humble and to sacrifice in times when we don't want to do that. You know what it means? It means that we let go this need uh, to be right and prioritize right relationship. It means that we make every effort to live in peace with everyone and be holy. Those are not my words. That can that comes from Hebrews 12, 14. It, it means that we pursue right relationship, even if people are not right or in the process of trying to get right. This, this is what Jesus did when he told Zacchaeus, a tax collector. Nobody liked tax collectors. They were like enemies. They were hated people. They stole money from people. Nobody liked them. But Zacchaeus was um, was, was in a tree while Jesus was speaking because he wanted to see. Jesus turns around, sees Zacchaeus and said, yo, Zacchaeus, I'm coming to your house for dinner to come hang out. And the people were like, yo, like that's foul. Jesus going to hang out with that dude? Like he's a sinner. He's a stealer. He's a, he's a thief. But Jesus was modeling for us what it means to pursue right relationship. We must do the uncomfortable work that Jesus shows us and that Paul writes about extensively to Christians. You know what that means? That means we need to be pursuing racist people. We need to be pursuing our enemies. We need to be pursuing people who have the wrong mindset about things. Not foolishly, not putting ourselves in harm's way, not, not being unwise, but when the opportunity presents itself, engaging with them. And we confront things that are not right with courage, conviction, humility, and sacrifice. And I believe the reason that we're not seeing unity or a movement towards unity as we're seeing all this civil unrest happen around us is because I think people are prioritizing being right over right relationship. And guess what? I don't expect non-Jesus followers to get that and understand that because the ministry of reconciliation was not given to them. It was given to Jesus followers. And oh, by the way, God didn't wait for us to get right before he sent Jesus. He sent Jesus before we got right to help us get right. You feel what I'm saying? So my question to you is, are you doing the ministry or the work of reconciliation? Second part of this is, is found in verse 19. Um, God committed to us the message of reconciliation. Now you might be saying, now isn't that the same thing? Well, yes and no. And here's what I believe. If the ministry of reconciliation is our work or our actions, then the message of reconciliation are our words, what we are saying. And the ministry and the message need to go hand in hand. And I think the ministry often needs to go before the message because people are more influenced by what you do than what you say. And what you do and how you treat people and how you engage and how you serve, those are actions. Those open the hearts for people to hear the message. But too many times we're trying to preach the words of Jesus without displaying the ways of Jesus. Notice in the gospels that Jesus went around healing and he went around uh, touching and engaging 
with people who were castaways, who were, were some even considered to be sinners. He, he had compassion for the brokenness amongst people and the common person. God's way of reconciling us back to him was to be with us in the form of Jesus. You know, I've got this mentee. His name is Isaiah. Man, I love Isaiah. I've been with him since he was in the eighth grade. Uh, by the way, I have a son named Isaiah also, so I've got two Isaiahs uh, in my life. But but my mentee, Isaiah, he's a rising junior. I've been with him since he was in the eighth grade. He's a football player. And one of the things that I committed to him was, hey, I will be at every single football game. I will be there. You will hear me. You will know that I'm there. I will be supporting you. I know how, I know how important support is. He comes from a single um, a single a parent home. Um, and so me being there is important. Well, I had a conference last October in Philadelphia um, and his game was in the middle of this of this conference. So I drove to Philly, um, you know, from from Baltimore, which isn't that far, drove a couple hours. So drove a couple hours to Philly, you know, checked in, you know, did the conference, left later that afternoon, drove all the way to Alexandria, Virginia, about, uh, I don't know, four hours maybe, um, to be at his game. I was there on time. After the game, I drove all the way back to Philly to be at this conference. And the reason that I did that was because I wanted my actions to precede my words. So now when I'm sharing the message of reconciliation with Isaiah, when I'm, when I'm talking to him, he can see that my actions are aligned with what I'm saying. I was earning the right to be heard, which is one of the sayings uh, of a group called Young Life that I've been a part of. Are we earning the right to be heard? Isaiah has seen my heart. Now he's open to hearing my words. What this means for us as we move to verse 20 is that we then become ambassadors. And the message of the ambassador is this. We implore you to be reconciled. Come back into relationship. Stop doing the things that divide and separate. Stop being drunk with the elixir of power and rightness. There is another and a better way through the example of Jesus, which Paul writes about in verse number 21. So look, as I just bring this to a close for us, I, I just want to say, what is the execution of this ministry and message of reconciliation? So we talked about what the ministry of reconciliation is, what the message of reconciliation is, but what, what is the execution of this? How, how does this work? Well, it has to be fueled by one thing, and it's love. And guess what you can't have without love? Humility and sacrifice, the things that I've been mentioning throughout this message. And Paul, in the previous letter, to the Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians, he talks about this. He goes on this whole thing about unity and diversity and how we need to be together and all of these sorts of things. But you know how he ends it? He ends it talking about love. Listen to what he says, 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always preserves. Love never fails. And he goes on to talk about how all of these other things that we value will pass away and fail. But the power of love will not. And you know what? Sometimes it's hard to love people. Sometimes it's hard to do this ministry and this and, and, and share this message of reconciliation. But this is what we've been called to do and how we've been called to make things right in the world, representing Jesus as am 
ambassadors. We must be fueled by humility and sacrifice. And we can't do that without love. So listen, as you're going about this semester, as you're figuring out how to engage, as you're figuring out how to respond, as you're figuring out what to do and, and how to act, remember the ministry of reconciliation, the message of reconciliation, and it being fueled by love. Let me just pray for you. God, we thank you so much for these students, for this university, how they're preparing next generation leaders. And God, help us to be your ambassadors who are reflecting your love. Help us to be safe. Help us to be unwise. I'm sorry, help us to be wise and not unwise as we uh, engage around us. But help us to do so with courage and conviction and humility and love to be a reflection of who you have called us to be, to bring us in right relationship with you and right relationship with one another. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, God bless Vanguard. Hope to see you soon.